<laughs> I recorded the concrete one, and then uh, I forgot to hit record on the steel design one. I apologize. Um, whoops. We all we all got to get used to this. You said assume included if we don't know. That is correct. Um, remember, if whenever you look at like just go to table seven one and take a look at this. Whenever you have a bolt, look at the same bolt whether it, the threads are included and the threads are excluded. And the threads, the one with the threads included, always has a lower capacity. Whenever you don't know, always assume that the threads are included in the shear plane. That is correct. It might be worthwhile uh, if, if a couple of people um, during our, our lectures, I'll do my best to try and remember to hit record. I apologize for, for not remembering at the beginning. Uh, it's taking a little getting used to the new setup. But uh, but to, to answer Connor's question in more detail, I plan to record everything from here on out. There's a question in concrete design as to whether or not I plan to upload to YouTube. And the answer is yes. It just might take me a little bit longer. The software that I used before automatically uh, uploaded uh, to YouTube. This, I, I have to manually go do it, so it just might take a little bit longer. Um, but I do plan to upload everything to the YouTube playlist between now and the rest of the semester. Just give me a little bit of time on that. Why do we only add 1 16th instead of 1 8th of an inch for the bolt diameter gain? Okay, great question. Um, when we did tension members, we added an eighth of an inch to the diameter of the bolt, uh, but that was a little bit hidden. When we were doing tension members, we actually added a sixteenth twice. We added one sixteenth for erection tolerance and one sixteenth for damaged material. So the erection tolerance, the reason that we did that is because Remember, if you have a bolt, like a half inch diameter bolt, you can't drill the hole a half diameter. You actually have to drill the hole a little bit larger than the bolt to actually put the bolt in the hole. It actually, you have to have it a little bit larger. So standard bolt holes are drilled one, six, one sixteenth of an inch larger. So that was the erection tolerance. That's why we added a, a sixteenth of an inch. We added another sixteenth of an inch for damaged material. So in tension members, we, we looked at the hole, we said, how effective is that little lip of material around the bolt? Um, how effective in, is that in transferring load to the member as a whole? And we decided, oh, no, it's really not that effective at all. So for tension members, we didn't count on that little lip of material around the bolt hole to transfer load to the member. So that's why with tension members, we added an eighth of an inch. But for uh, for bolted connections, we are actually looking at the hole. We are actually looking at the physical dimensions of the hole. We are actually investigating the plate as is. So in bolted connection land, we add a sixteenth of an inch only because the only thing that we need to add is the sixteenth of an inch to account for how big the hole actually is. Okay. So keep in mind with both tension members and bolted connections, the hole is still physically one sixteenth of an inch larger. We just added an extra sixteenth for tension members because we didn't count on that little lip of material transferring load to the member as a whole. But because we're not looking at the member as a whole, we don't add that here. Did that, did that answer your question? Good deal. Can you explain again how to tell if the connection has adequate bearing capacity? Sure. The simple way is to just look at this problem here. So let me go back to the to the beginning of the problem. Um, if you go to the beginning of the problem, this problem had uh, a factored load of 15 kips and a live load of 35 kips. So the simplest way to answer your question is to always look at loads and resistances, and that's the case with everything. This connection as a whole has a factored load of 74 kips. Now, when you look at bolt bearing, the, 
bearing capacity of the connection as a whole is 104 kips. So the connection as a whole has more capacity than the load that we're putting onto it. So that's why it has adequate bearing capacity because VRN, for, for this particular example that I'm talking about, VRN is 104 kips and the factored load is 74 kips. So it's got more capacity than it does load. But, but again, make sure that when you're when you're making that assessment that you look at the bearing capacity of the connection as a whole and then the load on the connection as a whole. Look at it all. Did that did that answer your question? Good deal. Let me go back to the let me go back to the slides. see something so while everybody is um, is uh, still going through my questions because I started the recording late I'll just really really briefly go through the announcement slides again just to make sure that everybody's clear the exam the exam opens at 4 closes at 7 it's designed to be 50 minutes long so even though there's a three-hour window it should, shouldn't take you that long I just wanted to make sure and give you all flexibility in the middle of all this you know COVID-19 uh, 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 craziness we're dealing with. It's open book and open notes. You can use any resource on Blackboard, homework solutions, lecture notes, anything. As long as you don't give or receive aid for another individual, you can really use anything that you want. Um, remember, everything will be found in this new folder on Blackboard. Uh, everything, the exams, homeworks, lecture notes from here on out. Uh, five short answer questions, three workout problems. Again, I'm trying not to be uh, curveball-ish, if you want, we're really trying to reduce the amount of curveballs. I just want to keep everything straightforward and to the point. All the questions, please type out an answer for every question. Even the computational ones, type out an answer. It really helps me with grading. Don't just answer the question on your scratch paper. Just make sure and type it out as well. You'll need to upload uh, a scan PDF of your calc. So I would recommend Cam Scanner. Any app that can convert it to a scan PDF would be fine. Just do me a favor and write legibly so that I can read uh, what you're writing. Um, again, basics of bolted and welded connections. Um, make sure that you can understand the fundamentals of welding behavior, uh, bolted behavior, and analyze and design basically everything on homework four uh, and homework five. Uh, and then here's our bolted connection formulas um, for bolt shear capacity, bolt slip capacity, bolt bearing capacity, and combined loading, and some additional expressions on where to look up certain values, uh, as well as bolt spacing and edge distance requirements. And finally, the welded uh, connection uh, formulas, not just for capacity, but for uh, weld limitations as well. Are there any other questions? Uh, in the chat, please. I want I want to make sure that that everybody's got all of their questions answered. I want this uh, I want the exam to be uh, as as comfortable a process as it can be given given our scenario. we expect a diagonal bolt load are you referring to the um uh combined loading scenario uh where you had to use um the the expressions on the bottom of the slide that you see on the screen is, is that the problem that you're talking about Okay, uh, sure, yes, you, you can, you can expect that. Um, yeah. <laughs> that doesn't, that doesn't mean it, it, it will be on the exam, but it is something that is, is a uh, fair game.
do you have any specific questions about um, combined loading or does anybody example 14 in the notes oh give me a sec give me give me one second I'm pulling up something to go through that, but again, don't don't let um, don't let that um, interrupt any questions. If you all have any questions, please continue to to ask away. My PowerPoint is is getting slow on me. Hold on. You're talking about the the balanced weld problem. Okay. Um, give me one second. Uh, unfortunately, the software that we use for uh the the notes that i do in class is not available to us at home but i believe i've got something i can use that will that will get us around that give me one second okay. actually give, give me one second i gotta grab something real quick I've got a file on my hard drive I believe I can use to go through that. Again, if you it, keep keep uh, if anybody has any questions, keep uh, keep keep them coming. Okay, um, one sec. All right, I'm going to stop sharing this and I'm going to share another file. Okay, uh, so everybody should be able to see the uh, the example problems notebook. Um, I apologize for these weird sort of circular dots that show up. Um, sometimes when you take the smart notebook software and convert it to PDF, this happens. So I, I apologize for that. There's really nothing I can do about it. But it shouldn't be too much in the way of, of what we're doing. So this this is from a, a previous set of notes that I had developed. Uh, that I did this calculation, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, but it's the same example, so it should follow pretty straightforwardly. So we have a factored load on this uh, of 150 kips. Um, the material properties it was E70 electrode, so 70 ksi, uh, 50 ksi, and 65 ksi for the yield and tensile strength for the base metal. 
Uh, now, for our weld limits, remember, A min, you look it up, but A max, you compute. And so it was between 3 sixteenths and 5 sixteenths. For design, whenever you are um, designing a fillet welded connection, in most cases, uh, what you're going to want to do is deposit the largest weld size possible, not the smallest, okay? Because the larger the weld size, the smaller the necessary weld length. So it's quicker to deposit. So when, whenever you have a range between A min and A max, you always want to lean towards A max because it's uh, the larger weld size. Um, for most of the problems that uh, fillet weld designs that we deal with as structural designers, we can usually get by though with welds, uh, usually sometimes uh, 5 sixteenths or less. Um, if you're ever choosing a weld size, what I always tell uh, students is to try, try and always stick with 5 sixteenths as, as often as possible. Because 5 sixteenths is about the largest welds that you can deposit with a single pass of a fillet weld. So I had a range of 3 sixteenths to 5 sixteenths. I'm going with, with 5 sixteenths. Um, if it was a range between 3 sixteenths and like 6 sixteenths, I would probably still choose 5 sixteenths because again, it's the largest weld that you can deposit in a single pass. Now, as for the capacity of one inch of weld um, with A as 5 sixteenths, a uh, 3 eighths inch thick uh, angle and a one inch long weld, um, these are the capacities. Um, that was in our previous example. Um, I can cover that if you would like, but those are pretty straightforward calculations. They are very plug and chug. Like for instance, the formula for weld metal capacity is the fee value times 0.6 times FEXX, which is right there, times 0.707 times A, which is 5 sixteenths, times the length of the weld, which is one inch. So, so it's all literally uh, right there. And so that comes out to be 6.96 kips per inch. And then the same thing with the others. And you just choose the smallest one because the smallest weld size is going to govern how you design. Now, because we're dealing with a, uh, a balanced weld, we have three welds that we have to figure out. We have the two longitudinal welds, which would be F1 and F3. And then we have the transverse weld, which is F2, okay? Now, F2, you can figure out. It's 6.96 kips per inch, and that weld is six inches long. Uh, so it's, that weld can supply 41.76 kips of capacity. Remember, we're putting 150 kips on it. So we got to size three welds to resist 150 kips. So we have F1 and F3, which we really need to figure out. Now, remember, um, the load is 150 kips, and it goes through the centroid, OK? Now we have a six by four by three eighths inch angle. And if you look at the way that, that the weld is going, the weld is going through the centroid and based off of the dimensions, the dimensions that you would look up, you know, in here, um, we end up using Y bar because Y bar is the distance from the short leg to the centroid, which is what we need right here in, in the images, uh, that distance from the bottom to the centroid. That's from the short leg to the centroid. If you need the distance from the long leg to the centroid, you would use X bar. Okay. So, but because the, because of the way the weld is configured, we need uh, we need Y bar here. Now, what we need to do is solve for F1 and F3, and then it becomes an equilibrium problem. So, to solve for F1, I sum moments about the back of the angle. So I've got so what do I have? I've got PU times Y bar going this way, and then going the other way. I've got F1 times six inches, and I've got F2 times three inches, okay? So uh, the one thing I don't know is F1, so just solve, and F1 comes out to be like 27 point some kips. Um, and so since the weld can supply 6.96 kips per inch, just divide and I get like 3.93 inches. So I just use four inches. Now, sum of moments tells me what F1 is. Sum of forces tells me what F3 is. So sum forces in the X direction, I get PU to the right, F1, F2, F3 to the left. Just subtract to get F3, and you get like 80.87 kips. And so divide that by 6.96, and that comes out to be about 11.6 inches. So just round that up to 12, and that's your answer. So just use a 4-inch weld on the top. 
a six inch transverse weld and a 12 inch longitudinal weld across the bottom. Now this formulation is if the, you have two longitudinal welds and one transverse weld. If you're not going to use a transverse weld, just set F2 equal to zero and do everything the exact same way. Um, and what will happen is if you set F2 equal to zero, the top and bottom weld will be a little bit longer than, than what they are here. So instead of four and 12, I don't know, you might get like six and 16. I don't, I don't know, whatever makes sense. Um, but in the end, it'll all add up uh, to, to supply uh, 150 kips. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's it in that show. Um, I want to make sure I answered your question. Are there any specific items that, that you're, you're unsure about or is there anything specific I can go through here? And let me be clear, this is only, one other thing I want to answer, this is only if your member is like an angle or, or, or something that's unsymmetric. Like if it's just a plate or a, uh, even like a wide flange or something like that, you don't really need to do this. Just put half up top and half on the bottom. This is only when there's, there's uh, an absence of symmetry. You're doing this so that the weld won't have any, uh, any eccentricity. So Austin, did, did that did that answer? Is there anything specific I can I can speak to? Okay, good. What about everybody else? Is there any other questions? We still have about five minutes, so I want to make sure that I'm, you know, answering uh, that I'm that I'm answering all your questions as, as well as I can. Again, I, I mentioned this at the beginning, and I guess it didn't make it to the recording, but but I'll go ahead and mention it again. Um, I checked before class, and most of you had submitted um, your homework five. If I get, I know I said that that um, I wanted them by 4 p.m., but if everybody submits them early, I will I will post the solution early. Okay, I'm uh, currently on Blackboard. I'm missing um, three of them. Uh, I, I'm not, I mean, you can wait till four, that's fine. Uh, but if you, uh, if you submit uh, early, I'll, I'll post the solution early. Are you saying that if it was a symmetric plate, there wouldn't be a need for transverse flow? No, uh, what, what I was saying is this, if, if uh, the plate was symmetric, then there's no need to do this balancing, this like summing moments aspect. Just put half the load on one side and half the load on the other. You can put a transverse weld on there if you would like, uh, but in this particular problem, see how on the screen there's four inches up top and there's 12 inches on the bottom? The reason for that is because the angle is not symmetric. The centroid of the angle is not running through the middle. It's like, it's, it's lower. Because the centroid is lower, there's more weld along the, the back of the angle than there is along the front. If the weld was symmetric, if the plate was symmetric, if it was a plate or a wide flange or something like that, anything that exhibited symmetry, you could just half and half it. Um, so let's, let's take this particular example. So I've got what? Four plus six is 10 plus 12 is 22. If this was symmetric, if it was a plate, I could just do 11 and 11. Or I could do 6 and then put the remainder, put half and half. Like, I don't know, uh, what is that? Uh, 6, 22 minus 6 is, uh, what was that? 16, 6, 8 and 8. I could do that. I could do 6, 8 and 8. Um, I'm saying that, that if... The, the, because the plate is symmetric, you don't need to sum moments. You can still put a transverse weld on there if you'd like. That's fine. Now, one other thing, don't put just a transverse weld. If you put just a transverse weld, you create a connection that is not very ductile. When it fails, it fails quick. So make sure that if you're going to put a transverse weld, that there better be longitudinal welds to go along with it. Did that, did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, good. Any other quick questions?
I'll give y'all another minute to see if there's any others. Just to be clear, you want us to submit a Word document with the answers to all the problems? No, 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 no. Um, you don't need to submit a Word document. When you open up the, the, the test, each problem will have a dialog box to where you can type in the answer. I want you to type in the answer for the dialog in the dialog box for each problem. At the end, you just submit a, a scanned PDF of your solutions. But no, I, I don't want a Word document with your uh, with the answers. When you open the test, you will see. So, for instance, like let 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 let's uh, let's ask a question from uh, uh, an, another class. Like, let's say we were talking about concrete or something. Um, uh, you know, what is like? Let's say I asked you a question like, "What does FC prime stand for?" You would type the compressive strength. You know, you would you would type it out in the dialog box on the exam. The only thing that you need to upload is a scanned PDF of your 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 scratch calculations. But you don't need a separate Word document or anything. Any other real quick questions I can answer? Well, I, I'm not seeing any, so here, here's what we're going to do. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording here in a second. I just want to mention a couple quick uh, housekeeping items. Uh, don't forget to upload your homework 5 by 4 o'clock today. Uh, the exam will open at 4, close at 7. Um, I, I am going to um, money smiley face. Okay. <laughs> um, I am going to... Uh, keep sort of virtual office hours, um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 1 to 3, and then Tuesday, Thursday, 10 to 12. Um, if you ever have any questions, you can email me, you can call me. I'll probably start a Microsoft Teams account for the class, so we can even have a video chat one-on-one -on -one if you ever have any questions moving forward. Um, but with that, um, I wish everybody the best of luck on the exam. Um, again, if you have any questions between now and then, uh, please do so. And again, if everybody uploads their homework five, I'll post the solution early. Um, with that, that's all I have, everybody. Um, I will uh, catch you next time and best of luck on the exam.